Good evening everyone. Guys, I'm going to give you a World War 3 update and I'm going to concentrate on the four hotspots at the moment. I'm going to tell you what's happening right now and then I'm going to give you a ton of speculation on what I think is going to happen and how I think these things are going to unfold. Remember guys, this is my spec. I'm going to give you what's happening and then I'm going to give you my speculation. So none of you guys can complain about fake news and hopefully I won't end up in the gulag. Just before we start, a lot of people on the mainstream now are talking about subversion. I just watched an interview with um, on GB News and there's a guy and he's talking about, you know, how the UK is heavily ideologically subverted. Now, I did a video back on subversion, maybe maybe a month ago, I think. And I talked about the phases of subversion and how, you know, the United Kingdom at the moment, it is heavily, heavily subverted. You know, we've been demoralized. We've been destabilized. We've got a situation at the moment now where people, you know, and I saw it on the TV, uh, you know, I saw it on this, um, you know, on this on this uh, interview. And this guy he says to this woman who was arguing with him, he says, then the guy says to him, you do realize you're heavily subverted. And this woman who was arguing with him, she didn't even know she was being she was subverted. And the basis of this woman's argument was. He referred to the Union flag as something that represents the English. And they were having kind of this technical argument over, you know, who identifies with the Union flag. And the gentleman's argument was, well, the English do identify with it. And the lady's argument was, it's not just the English that identify with it because the Union flag is present in, I think, over 22 other countries. So they were having this absolutely absurd argument over nothing. And the gentleman, he was saying, your arguments are a subverted argument where you're picking little things in your, and you think they're important when the reality is they're not important. But that's kind of the basis of subversion. You want to divide people and make people argue among themselves. And one of the main ways you can do this is you target the education system. So rather than, you know, rather than math, science, um, you know, and ma rather, sorry, rather than maths, science, your sciences, your English, you know, your solid subjects, you teach things like, what is it, this, um, this, what's this Australian, you, you all know what I'm talking about, the Australian woman who's just been, oh, what's the, the breakdancing Australian woman, she's got like a degree in contemporary movement or something, so you give the educational, the education system, all these fake academic, you know, achievements and then you tell these people that they're just as qualified as the person who's got a master's in you know who's got a degree in physics and a master's in astro astrophysics you know and then these people who are a bit i've got to say guys you know if you've got a degree in contemporary movement you're a bit thick it's not a proper degree guys i don't care i'm not being politically correct anymore i've passed caring all right if you've got one of these degrees in contemporary movement you're a bit thick, right? I, I, I genuinely don't care anymore, right? And a lot of the people who do have degrees in, even people who have degrees in good subjects, they lack critical thinking. And it's kind of, and that's kind of a really important thing that we're, um, that we're lacking in today's society. Because, you know, where do, where do, poli where do people go for information? You know, your best, your, your best politician, you know, he wants some scientific evidence. So where does he go? He's going to go to the university to speak to the best professor. And the best professor is going to be readily available. And he's going to give you, and what do professors do? They sit, they lounge around all day eating grapes. <laughs> Guys, I know a lot of professors and they'll be laughing when I say that. You know, now professors at universities, they don't really produce much. They don't produce stuff. They don't produce products. They don't produce stuff for the market. What they do do is create knowledge. Now, ugh, guys, this is a, you know, that's a big topic. Um, now, when you create knowledge, you don't have any, you're, you're kind of, you don't have any of the outside influences. Like, okay, right, we've created this knowledge. Right, okay, what's it good for? Can you turn it into a product? Can you employ people? Can you pay taxes on it? 
That's what people in the private industry do. So you get this disparity between people in the private industry, you know, a scientist in the private industry and a professor in a university. Of course, the professor in the university is the go-to guy for politicians because, you know, people in private industry, they probably won't talk to politicians. So then we get this situation now, like you have now, where you have politicians going and asking people, you know, who've got their degree in contemporary movement, you know, about policy making, And it's just absolutely absurd. Anyway, so that's kind of, you know, one of the ways you can subvert a nation. And then over time, you know, over time, these people have this sense of importance because they have their degree and, you know, they're, they're, an educa they're educated in contemporary dance. And then when it comes to the real world and they have to do real stuff, then they have absolutely no idea what they're doing. They don't know how to move forward. They have no concept of reality. And then the people who know they've been subverted, they're like, ah, let's go and tell that person that they're really clever with their, uh, with their um, you know, what did I say, liberal move, uh, contemporary movement. And if, they, and if they're really clever, they'll click this, you know, they'll like this, whatever I'm doing, or they'll follow this policy, or they'll push this agenda. And that's how you subvert. And it, guys, it's not a short period. It doesn't, it, it's not done overnight. 15, 20 years is kind of the minimum time bracket for the initial stage, which is demoralization, where you pump this into a nation and make a nation start to self love you know and this is what i saw on the tv i saw a you know what obviously there were two different sides of this argument and i saw the woman self love she was british and she was self love in britain and then the gentleman was saying you're heavily subverted and the reality was she didn't know herself that she was subverted and that's kind of the genius of subversion but yeah it takes about 15 20 years to do this because you need to get the the people who are going in at the universities they need to do their education. They need to, uh, you know, be under the influence of subverted ideology. And then they need to be in positions of power. And once they're in positions of power, that's when you can come in with the next stage, which is uh, destabilization, which is when you cause riots, when you cause the division in streets, when you cause protests, where you say, right, they want to take this away from you. Fight. They want to take that away from you. Fight. They... And you see what I mean? So that's the stage we're in at the moment. And I think, you know, one of the people put on the comments that we're in the crisis mode now. I don't think we're in crisis mode yet. I think we're, we're, we're heading there, but we're, we're still in um, we're still in the uh, destabilization phase at the moment. So that's kind of, you know, the backdrop to this video that the United Kingdom and the West in general is heavily subverted. Um, and, and it's been done over the last maybe 60 years. You can probably put, if you were to put a timestamp on it, I'd say, um, I'd say 1962 was when the, you know, when we started to become subverted, which is when the Soviet Union knew that they couldn't take on NATO at a force by force. So they'd start to do subversion. They start to put all their military efforts into the um, ideological subversion, which makes a country a lot easier to overthrow. And it's also easier if the country tears, its part, tears itself apart anyway because then you don't even need to send your troops in. You know, you can just sit back and watch. And like I said before, this is done on a relatively long time frame. So whereas Putin, if you think about Vladimir Putin, the first prime minister, I mean, look at Zelensky, he's gone through four British prime ministers. Uh, when you look at, think about Vladimir Putin, he's his first prime minister that he met was Tony Blair. Now think about the evolution and the the phases that the United Kingdom has gone through. And Putin's just been there, sat back, watching, waiting, you know, watching his subversion tactics go higher and higher. And, you know, till the stage where, you know, there could be an argument, and I've done uh, a video previously, where Keir Starmer went to a Czechoslovakian workers' camp in 1980. I think it was 1986. Guys, you'll have to check the video I did. It's on, um, I, it's, I, I'll, I'll link it at the end of the video I did. I think it's 1986 or it might be 88 or it might even be earlier. It was in the 80s. Uh, he went to a, basically, Keir Starmer went to a workers camp, a Soviet Union workers camp in Czechoslovakia in the 80s. He was identified as a person or that could be exploited in the future. That's out there, guys. I shared the articles. Don't get me done for fake news because I'm just reporting on the articles. Now, there's a strong argument to say that Keir Starmer's already been subverted. And the reality is he just doesn't know. 
Of course, there'll be people around him influencing him, knowing that he's already been subverted. But when you're at a young age, you're very susceptible to outside influences. And that's, you know, that's why uh, people get, you know, people from these, you know, assumed high ranking universities, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, uh, London, London College, I think that's one as well, you know, and then they can subvert them. And then when they grow up and they're in, well, when they grow up, when they get into the positions of power, they then have a subverted person on the inside, which is what the West has at the moment now, guys, right? And I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any denying that. Anyway, so the four thing, the four areas of conflict that I'm looking at around the world now are the Russia-Ukraine conflict, or you could even say, you know, now the Ukrainians have, you know, got in, struck inside Russia, you can't, you could say it's the Ukraine-Russia conflict, but, you know, you've got the conflict in Eastern Europe, you've got the conflict that's brewing in the Middle East at the moment, and, you know, this is, it is going to, it, it's inevitable. And I'll read you some of the articles that, um, that have come out of Iran recently, I think in the last 24 hours. Then you've got China and Taiwan, which seems to be a slow burner at the moment, but I'll come on to that, you know, I'll come on to why I think that's a slow burner. And then the one that nobody's, it's not on anybody's radar apart from yours, is the Falklands. I've been talking about the Falklands for months and months and months. And nobody's been talking about it, but I think that is, um, you know, a high, that's got a high risk of, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, there's going to be another conflict in the Falklands. The financial reasons make it an, an inevitability. And don't forget, with all these conflicts that are going to happen, you're going to get, um, you know, those countries that are involved, they're going to have a degree of internal, well, homegrown sabotage, homegrown attacks homegrown civil unrest, you know, all these sort of things, you know, crime, sabotage, um, what did we call it in France, uh, coordinated sabotage, all these things are going to happen. And then the new, the new era that we've got at the moment is the cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are happening all the time. We always say on this channel that, you know, no private company is ever going to admit that they've been under a cyber attack because they're just going to lose money. They're going to lose so much money. Imagine now if your bank, whoever you bank with, wherever you bank, you know, if your bank just came out and made, did a press announcement and said, yeah, hey, everyone, uh, we was under cyber attack yesterday. Um, a few people lost some money, but if it's not, check your bank accounts. If you've not lost any money, you're okay. What are you going to do right now? Are you going to say, oh, okay, thanks. No, you're going to close that account and you're going to move within 10 seconds, you know, and that's going to be the end. That will literally be the end to that bank. So not one bank in a million years, not one private company, they're never going to admit that they are under cyber attack. But just look in the last 12 months, how many system updates that have caused an outage, how many, you know, what, what, do the, what, what what's the other one they say? Uh, third party errors have happened. All these things, and remember, the golden standard for cyber attacks is to cause a financial crisis. It's kind of the it's the main one. Obviously, you know they'll have other you know other other um, other targets, but the main one is always going to be the financial crisis because it affects everybody and it terrifies everybody. You know, nothing terrifies you more than going to the bank and not having any money. Although that does happen to me quite a lot, especially near the end of the month. Anyway, so let's go on then, guys. Okay, so in in Ukraine at the moment, or shall we say in Russia, the Ukrainians, the main news in Ukraine is that the Russians have be have had to um, take troops from areas that they were fighting in in Ukraine to reinforce this region in where the Ukrainians are pushing. Now, I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised because it's come out why that the Russians haven't just fired a ton of missiles into Kiev or sorry, not Kiev. So a lot of you, a lot of people are asking why Russia's not attacked Kiev as in the Kiev city centre like it could have done. Well, for those of you who don't know, Kiev is the birthplace of Russia because back in like hundreds of years ago, there was it was Kiev and Rus. And Kiev was the, you know, Kiev was the center and then Russia was born from Kiev. So Vladimir Putin, I think he wants to keep the historic home of Russia intact. That's why he's not, you know, sent in a load of missiles and leveled it to the ground like he has done with a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of regions out in the east of Ukraine. So at the moment, then, you know, the Russians are reinforcing this area. Obviously, the Ukrainians are reinforcing this area and taking more areas. 
What I think the two options, well, the, the two options for the Ukrainians are basically they're either going to stay or they're going to go. Now, if they stay, that means that Putin has to reinforce that area and he has to take that back. The, you know, there's no question about that. Putin can't continue with the war while there are enemy troops in his land. It's just not, it, you just can't do it like that. So that means that Putin would have to invest a ton of weaponry, a ton of manpower into that region. Now, the Ukrainians, they know this. Now, they can... Now, the Ukrainians know this, so... They understand this. So what their choice is, they can stay and fight and try and repel him as try and repel this advance as long as they can and hopefully degrade Putin's military as much as they can. Or whenever they feel it necessary, they just pull all their troops out and go back to a defensive line. I don't know which one would be most beneficial for the for the Ukrainians at the moment. Each one has its merits, each one has it has its downfalls. For example, if the Ukrainians stand and fight, they're going to take casualties, they're going to lose equipment, they're going to have failures, and at some point the Russians will push them back. That's an inevitability. But there will, you know, there will be huge tolls on the Russians as well. Now, when you're attacking, if you're an attacking force, attacking a defended location, usually the ratio is three to one. So let's use that ratio. You would have to have three Russian attackers to every one Ukrainian defender. Now that's that's on that's if you're talking about peer on peer what we've seen and again this is unsubstantiated i don't know if it's true it's just what i've seen on social media you've seen a lot of british and american accents in that area so sending conscripts against trained brits trained americans it's you're going to need a lot more than three to one so that means that putin's manpower and his attrition rate is going to be a lot higher so that's the you know the pros and cons if they stay if they go and they just make an, you know, if they just make a withdrawal, they're going to keep all their equipment, they're going to keep all their manpower, and the Russians are going to be vastly, vastly demoralized because that's going to mean that the Ukrainians are in control. The Ukrainians pushed in, they striked, they did did the task, whatever the task was, and then they pulled out when it was on their terms. Now, if you, if you come out on your terms. You've got all your kit and equipment, you've got morale, you've got fighting capacity, and you've got those soldiers who are experienced that you can then push forward into another region. So each option there is available to Zelensky or the military, um, you know, the military, whoever's whoever's in control, I don't know, maybe, maybe NATO military, I don't know. So they're the two options for the Ukrainians. The only real option for Putin is he needs to take it back now. There's a lot of ways. We, there's a lot of ways he can do this. His his infantry are, are not his infantry, and he knows this. His infantry can't take on a NATO infantry, so he's going to have to use a lot of artillery. He's going to potentially have to use have to think about using a low yield tactical nuclear weapon with the escalate to de escalate doctrine that's that they've been using since 2010. So that's you know kind of the situation in with Russia and Ukraine at, at the moment. Where am I, guys? Where am I? I've totally lost my tangent. With the Middle East Middle East crisis, guys, I mean you've got Israel at the moment. Now let's not forget why this happened. This whole thing happened started really because of the seventh seventh of October attack. Now you can, I don't want to get into you guys. This whole situation, you know, this whole the whole area, it, it's 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 a hotbed. Like we're just going to go from there. I know that this goes back a long long way, and there's. You know, there's heated arguments on both sides. And I'll be fair, you know, I, when the Israelis started this campaign, I thought, you know what, guys, you are totally in your rights. The way they've dealt with it, it's I think they're create they could potentially be creating more enemies than they're creating allies. You know, the way they're dealing with it, I, I just and again, you know, I'm not anyone to dictate how anybody runs their military, but the way they're dealing with it, I think they're creating more problems for themselves than they're creating allies. But anyway, guys. We are where we are, and I'm just, you know, I'm just telling you what, what's what's happening. Now, to the north of Israel, you've got, um, well, let's get a little map up. Oh, it's gone off. Oh, it's gone off. Oh, embarrassing. Close, yeah. So to the north, you've got Lebanon. To the northeast, you've got Syria. Then to the west, you've got Jordan, which takes up most of the western front. Then you've got to the southwest, sorry, so, yeah, southwest, you've got Egypt. And then at the south, you've got Gaza. So 
you know, the Israelis are totally surrounded apart from the Mediterranean. Now, in the Mediterranean, you've got, you know, I, I don't know how many warships and aircraft carriers are moving into the, the Mediter Mediterranean, but you've got, I think the technical term, it, term is, a t is, a, is a shit ton of a shit ton of ships. I think we should use that term, guys, all right? So you've got a load of ships now, US warships moving into this region. With these warships, you've got electronic countermeasures, you've got anti-air, uh, uh, you've got air defense systems, you've also got aircraft carriers, you've got a lot of jets, you've got a lot of marines, you've got, a, you know, you've got a huge task force. And that's going to be very soon set off the coast of Israel. It came out that the, from the US, I think it was from the US Navy, but from US intelligence, that they've been told to hurry up and get there quicker. All those aircraft carriers that kind of paled into insignificance because Cyprus is just off the coast of Israel as well. Cyprus has a huge air base there, RAF Akateria. That air base can, you can land anything there, guys. You know, um, you can land anything there. It's got a huge runway. Now, People are saying that, you know, the Lebanon have already, sorry, uh, Hezbollah have already threatened to destroy this runway, to destroy these bases. That's fine, but technology is there to, you know, there's lots of, you know, the, the, you know, the Air Force are not stupid. They understand that their airfields are a target and they understand that their airfields are vulnerable. So there'll be a lot of air defences around those runways. Not only that, there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I want to use the word concrete. Yeah, we'll say concrete. There's a lot of concrete materials and, you know, materials technology that can be used to, you know, sort these gaps out, sort the, re, basically repair these runways. And these can be done, this can be done really quick. So I don't feel, I'm pretty convinced you can't sink a country, whereas, sorry, you can't sink an island, whereas you can pretty much sink these um, aircraft carriers. So you've got a lot of firepower in the Mediterranean now in support of Israel. So then you've got this greater, you know, this greater, um, I want to, yeah, I'll use the word crescent. You, then you've got this crescent of these nations that are surrounding Israel. And at the moment, I think we're waiting for a H hour that's going to be dictated by both Iran and Russia. And I think they're going to, guys, I think they're going to strike at the same time. Now, I did a video earlier. Where are we? Yeah, I did a video earlier and I talked about how the, and I, and I shared the link from the UK government website, how the UK government website and um, Keir Starmer have, you know, they've reached out to the Iranians and said, you know, we don't think you guys should strike Israel. We think, you know, you should hold off because you'll destabilize the region. How arrogant is Keir Starmer? How arrogant are the West actually to think that they can dictate what another, you know, that they can, that that's going to have any relevance at all on, on Iran's, you know, on, on Iran's position. Iran, they, they, they don't care. They don't care about what Keir Starmer thinks, you know. I think Keir Starmer should concentrate on stopping the boats. That, that should be his main intent, but it's fine if he wants to, you know, try and convince, you know, the Iranians not to strike Israel. Now, I'll share the link in the description to this guy's fact. No, I'm not really sharing it. Um, so this is a headline from Politico. I always like reading Politico. They seem to be more of a measured, they do have little biases, but they seem more measured. Fears grow of an Iranian attack on Israel as Tehran laughs off the West's plea to keep cool. International leaders joint, launch joint diplomatic push to calm tensions. So basically, you know, the um, the Iranians are laughing off the, you know, the, hang on, I'll read it here, guys. On Monday, the White House National Security Council spokesperson, John Kirby, said the Iranian attack could happen as soon as this week. Guys, be ready for Friday. These things happen on a Friday. They always happen on a Friday. I've told you millions of times why, all right? Just, I always go Friday to Friday. Of course, things may happen in the week, but normally they don't. Uh, could happen as soon as this week, but it was difficult to ascertain what the assault would look like. We have we have to be prepared for what could be a significant set of attacks, Kirby told reporters. During a rare phone call with the Iranian President Massoud, Massoud, I'm going to leave it there, British Prime Minister Keir Starmer urged him not to attack Israel and told him war was not on anyone's interest. 
And then, you know, they've come out and, you know, they're just, they're, they're laughing at Keir Starmer, basically. You know, I wouldn't laugh at Keir Starmer because I don't want to get put in the gulag because I think he's a cool guy. But you can see how, you know, these, um, you know, these, these, um, these diplomatic efforts, they're, they're pointless because people don't understand culture. I can guarantee you Keir Starmer doesn't understand this culture. I can guarantee you his um foreign secretary david lammy <laughs> i can guarantee you david lammy does not understand the middle east why because he's got no exposure he's got no experience he's never been to that country he's never lived there guys i've lived in the middle east for five years if you add it all up together you know i speak two different dialects of arabic i un and i don't claim to understand the, the middle east what i do claim to understand it is a lot better than Pretty much every politician that's in government at the moment. Anyway, so that's kind of, you know, the escalations that are happening at the moment in the Middle East. I think it's going to be a three prong attack on Israel from it's going to come from the north. It's going to come from the south. And it's also going to come from the far east by the likes of Iran firing missiles over. And I also think that Houthis, they're going to start um, they're going to start attacking again as soon as Israel gives the word. We then got the um, where are we? Where are we? I've missed it. I missed it. Yeah, we've then got the um, the situation in Taiwan. Now, these things in Taiwan, what's happening in Taiwan? It's kind of got a back burner at the moment, and not many people are talking about it. But the reality is, you've got you know you've got the Chinese coming out and saying they want to the re they want the reunicate the reunification of Taiwan. You've got the Taiwanese saying, no, 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 we don't want that. We want to be independent. So, you know, that's the rhetoric that all that the basis of all this is from. You've got constant air incursions. You've got constant flexes of military might with, by the Chinese Navy. At the moment, I think you're going to have a coalition, and this will be a naval conflict. When this Taiwan thing happens, it'll be a naval conflict. And you will have um, Japan, Australia, New Zealand fronted by the United States. And that's going to be kind of the, the Pacific region, the Pacific theatre. You know, Japan, yeah, it's gonna, it'll be Japan, Japan, Australia, New Zealand and the United States. Of course, it'll be, it'll, there'll be other Pacific nations there, but they're going to be your main, that's going to be your main force. Now, most recently, the Australians have, they've, um, I don't know if they're ready yet, but they've certainly commissioned a fleet of new submarines. The Japanese have a strong navy. The New Zealand, they have a really strong ground force and really strong infantry. Although I don't think it's going to go there, I think there will be some military used to reinforce Taiwan in some sort of capacity. But I think the Chinese are waiting for the co these conflicts in the Middle East and the conflict in Eastern Europe to flare up even further what, and wait until the United States and Europe are already concerned on these conflicts because once that happens, it will be impossible. Well, it won't be impossible, but it will be harder for the Allies to, um, uh, what's the word, uh, organise and come to the aid of Taiwan. So that's kind of what I think is happening in that theatre. Now, the Falklands, guys. I'm. I think I'm the only person that is talking about this. That's talking about this now. The backdrop for the Falklands is the oil and the amount of money that's under that. You know, the Falklands controls the Falklands, guys. Just in a nutshell, the Falklands controls more oil, almost double the amount of oil than Saudi Arabia has. That is a huge. That is a huge amount of money. And um, anybody that thinks that, you know, holding on to the Falklands has anything to do with diplomacy, anything to do with human rights, that you're, mis you're misguided. It's everything to do with money. It's everything to do with oil. And it's everything to do with energy. Whoever takes that oil will be the next superpower. That's just the way it is, guys, all right? Too much money too much uh, energy and too much, you know, too much capacity. And that's just what's being found now. There'll be further oil exploration. There'll be further discoveries. That's, and again, that's just in oil. What about the other uh, uh, the other minerals that are down there? You know, it's, it's a huge capacity. 
And also, whoever owns the Falklands, whoever controls the Falklands, controls Antarctica because that sliver of um, land, well, that sliver of uh, British Antarctic territory that moves into the uh, into Antarctica. If you think about it on a map, or you've got, I'll put a link in the description. Um, that sliver controls the peninsula. That is the only entry point onto Antarctica. So if you control the entry point, and Britain have done this fabulously over the years, over the hundreds of years, if you control the entry point, you control the country. If you control the, you know, like if you if you control that entry point, it doesn't matter who controls the country. It doesn't matter what stake what other nation has in that, you know, in that piece of land. If to get through to get to it, they have to pass through your territory. You you can tax them heavily. So you see where I'm, so that is really why it's of so much importance. Now, most recently, what's been happening? The Argentinians have been buying amphibious assault vehicles. They've been buying F-16s. They've been buying you know they've been upgrading their military in a bid to have that capacity to have another crack at the Falklands. Also, from the Falkland side, you know, none of this is in the, none of this has had any, has come up, you know, nobody's talking about this in the news, nobody's talking about this in politics or anything, but the Argentinians are spending 120 million upgrading their docks. Why? Because they're getting ready to receive this oil. And if you think about Iran, off the coast of Iran, um, on the, in the Strait of Hamuz, there's a little island, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, there's a little island, and basically that little island is a gas oil separation plant. So the raw crude goes into that island. It's then processed into, I don't know, gas, diesel, petrol, and, and the rest of the hydrocarbon um, family. And then that's pushed on then for, it gets sold or shipped to wherever, or it's used wherever. Now, that's kind of a nutshell, what's happening with the um, situations. I think, let's start with the Falklands then, because it's fresh. I think the Falklands, well, let's put the Falklands and China in the same uh, category. I think the Falklands, i.e. Argentina, I think they're waiting for these conflicts to go, to kick off bigger because like China, Argentina doesn't want to fight Britain if Britain is at full strength. If Britain's already tied up in Eastern Europe, if Britain's tied up somewhere else, then they won't have as many assets to go and protect the Falklands. That will obviously mean, you know, it will be an easier walk for the Argentinians when they move into um, try and take Argent the Falklands again. The Russians, I think the Russians are going to try and, you know, try and um, rearm, rearm the Argentinians. It makes no sense for the Russians not to ally with the Argentinians. Russia has already got, you know, they've got the fleet of ships, the dark fleet of oil tankers, that they're pushing and cruising around the world, you know, unchecked, unpoliced, unmonitored, unregulated. I did a video on it, you know, the um, and, and they already have that infrastructure. So for the Argentinians, the Russians become a very, you know, a very um, appealing partner. Not only can they provide weapons, not only can they provide um, the ships to deal with the oil, but they can provide the customers as well and the currency to do that. So at some point, I think you're gonna see Argentina moving to the BRICS trade alliance. And then at that point, it's pretty much game, set and match. I don't think he's gonna do that now because he wants to buy Western arms because they're just better than, you know, Eastern Bloc arms because they're built under capitalism and everything built under capitalism is better. Guys, there's no argument there, so I don't want any. Um, with China and Taiwan, again, I think they're waiting for these um, these incidents to flare up in the Middle East and with Russia and Ukraine. I think they're waiting for that to go even further, if you can imagine such a thing. Now, brings us back to the, you know, the main question. What's happening in the Middle East? What's happening with Ukraine? Well, I just saw an article earlier, an exclusive to Reuters, Iran to deliver hundreds of ballistic missiles to Russia, Intel secure, uh, sources say. So as of August the 9th, dozens of Russian military personnel are being trained to use the FAF-360 FAF close-range ballistic missile systems. So there you've got the Iranians now supplying Russians with more munitions. I think... This, I think what they're going to do, I think the Middle East and Russia, I think they're going, I think there's just going to be one big escalation. 
Um, you know, and I think that's going to happen. I think they're going to do it together. Why do I think they're going to do it together? Because if you do things, you know, if you if you you know double your forces, then the West will only have will have limited resources to react. And again, everybody will be scrambling around trying to do things, trying to call people off leave, trying to take resources. There'll be mistakes made. You know, people will be on leave. People's kids will be at, won't be at school. They'll be on holiday. They'll be trying to call the kids back because they're worried about their kids more than what's happening at work. And all sorts of wild stuff will be happening. That's why I think they're going to do it. I, I do think they're going to do that pretty soon. So anyway, guys, I've been waffling for far too long. That's kind of like... Um, you know, in a nutshell, what I think is, well, what is happening in the world with my speculation added to that for your Brucey bonuses. So that's what I think is going to happen. I do think we should work and, you know, work Friday to Friday, especially when you're thinking about the Middle East. The Middle East, the Friday, so, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really important day for people in the Middle East, the Friday. So that's why I think these things often happen in the Middle East on a Friday. With Ukraine and Russia, we've just got, a, you know, the, these things are, you know, they're, they're, they're fluid situations. They have two, the Ukrainians have two choices. They stay and fight, which has its advantages, and it has its disadvantages. Or they leave, which has its advantages, and it has its disadvantages, you know. And, and that's the situation as we are at the moment. Guys, I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to I'm going to mag to grid. And I'll get you guys. If there's any updates, I'll put them on. I'll put them on. And equally, I will speak to you guys in the morning. Don't forget to like and subscribe.